Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. If you watch the show regularly, you know that in June, we had Lifestyle Medicine Week, where we featured a week's worth of lifestyle medicine doctors who all were of Indian descent, but living and practicing in the United States. Well, people said, why don't you get us some doctors that actually practice in India? So we are doing the same thing for an entire week, and we're kicking the week off with Dr. Nandita Shah. Please welcome her to the show. It's so nice to meet you in person, or virtually in person. I'm such a fan of yours, so I'm so honored to be here. This is great. I, I, you, you do such great work. I mean, you even got an award from, from the president of India. That's true. It was just by chance or luck. But yeah, it was really a surprise and amazing. T tell us a little bit about your journey as a person who is not only plant-based, but practicing as a doctor of plant-based medicine. Okay, so I started out as just a regular doctor and I chose to practice homeopathy because it was holistic. And so from 1981, I've been practicing as a doctor. And uh, after about 10 years of practice, I was teaching all over the world, which is how I've been to the US so many times and how I even saw you, even though we didn't really meet, but I tasted your food. And, um, and so I was teaching um, homeopathy, advanced homeopathy all over the world. And what I, was, I grew up as a vegetarian, but, and I was so thankful that I was vegetarian just because I wasn't harming anyone. That's what I thought. But when I found out about the cruelty in da the dairy industry, I just had to change. And when I changed, that's when I started reading all the books and all the articles about how actually plant-based diet is so good for health. And so I changed my practice. It was kind of transitional, but I changed my practice. I stopped teaching homeopathy that I was teaching all over the world. And I started an organization called Sharan, you know, uh, which 16 years ago. And my goal was just like to help 365 people with plant-based diet per year. But of course, now I'm doing just much more. But at that time, there was no soya milk in India. We were about five vegans in India. So it was like something totally unknown. Everyone knew about vegetarianism. But the concept of veganism was totally you, you know, yeah. it, it, it's so interesting to me because a lot of times people assume that all people that live in India are vegetarian. But my understanding is it, it depends on the region that some are and some aren't. Is, is that correct? That's true. And actually, there are more um, non vegetarians than vegetarians in India. But it's just that so many people don't have the possibility of buying meat all the time. So they're eating less of it in proportion maybe, but India is the largest producer of milk in the world, the largest exporter of beef in the world. And they talk about holy cows. And I'm pretty sure that we produce a lot of chicken as well. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the compassion piece when it comes to dairy, because I've known people, I've been vegan for 44 years, and I've known people my entire life that said they were vegetarian for ethical reasons, not realizing that the cruelty in dairy and eggs is just as much as in meat, maybe even more so. True. And, you know, I didn't realize it for so long. Like, I was so happy that I was vegetarian, and I used to eat eggs too. And I thought that I was eating non-fertile eggs and so no babies were dying. And it took me a while to find out what was really happening. Actually, I did an internship at Farm Sanctuary in upstate New York. And I even went to their um, California um, sanctuary. And I would really recommend visiting any of those places to everyone. It was so eye-opening. I did it one month and I learned such a lot. Wow. You know, so many doctors that adopt a plant-based diet 
often do it mainly for health reasons, thanks to movies like Forks Over Knives. So it's, it's very rare when you see a doctor that does it primarily for ethical reasons first. Did you notice any difference though in your health or the health of your patients when you started taking out the dairy and eggs? A lot of difference. You know, I've been through so many illnesses and my mother died of cancer when I was just 25 and she was just 50. And so I realized that disease is a path to personal growth and uh, I actually had to treat myself the way I treat my patients now. So it was a whole learning process. And um, yeah, I mean, I became vegan for ethical reasons, but I started seeing and even seeing the articles and seeing the changes and you know, Chef AJ, the biggest change is in the state of mind. And that's what I really like to talk about because so many people have depression and uh, you know psychological disturbances. They're not happy and they're not at peace with themselves or with the world. And I think that so much of this, not everything of course, but so much of this is connected to what we put in our mouth. I believe you a hundred percent, even things like that people think of as, you know, benign and maybe not animal products like sugar. I mean, I was a sugar addict for 43 years and it, people that knew me when I was younger say, boy, you're so calm now. And it's like, yeah, cause I'm off the drugs, meaning sugar and caffeine. Yeah, 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 sure. And you know, uh, when we're stressed, we produce adrenaline. When animals are stressed, they produce adrenaline. And so when we consume, foods from animals, we are consuming their adrenaline. And I have to tell you that I've never felt at peace the way I do now as a child or as a young adult. And I know it's changing my diet. I'm also helping a lot of people who have depression and other psychological problems. Great. Well, did you want to share your slides at this point? Sure. Thank you. And then uh, we have a mutual friend, Sharon, at, who's actually submitted several questions for you when you have a chance to oh. answer them because she is a big, big fan of yours. Well, it's both ways. I really appreciate all that she does. And so, yeah, that, that's just a wonderful. Okay, so here are my slides. And me, yeah, um, perfect. And, and what I want to talk to you about today is making the connection between um, what happens to the animals and why we are plant-based brought me to my spiritual purpose. And my goal is that everyone really understands and achieves their spiritual purpose because, you know, we are on this planet to do all kinds of things. But if we don't reach our spiritual purpose, nobody's happy, you know. We are all here for a specific purpose and that's not just going out to restaurants or going to movies, but it's to achieve something in life. And I never knew what my spiritual purpose was, but making this connection brought me to my spiritual purpose. So I just want to say a little bit about Sharon. Sharon is an acronym for Sanctuary for Health and Reconnection to Animals and Nature. And I told you about how I was not well and I had to reconnect to nature in order to get well. So actually when, I'll tell you a little bit about how we think about it in Sharon. But at Sharon, we do various things to help people make the shift in the mindset in order to really get well. And we do programs for health gain, talks and events and things and we've been, so busy on Zoom all this lockdown. And then we have weight loss programs and we have a whole team of doctors and nutritionists because my goal has always been to spread this message. Like it's changed my life so much that uh, I, I've been doing training programs for cooking instructors and doctors and nutritionists for a long time now. And then we have a lot of cooking classes. And, you know, a lot of people think that plant, you know, Indian food is so, so um, special. 
And so a lot of people think that they'll miss something if they don't use oil or if they follow a whole food plant way diet. And so we teach people how they can eat almost anything and have it all whole plant based. And then we do a lot of education because um, it's not just like a whole food plant based diet can help you regain health, but it can also help the planet and animals. And so we have those sections as well. And then we have something really special, I think, which is our retreats. So we have 21 day health retreats. And the idea of 21 days is that it takes 21 days to change a habit. But also the idea is that, you know, we can do all the lab reports at the beginning. And then we have, you know, cooking classes every day and fabulous buffet meals and lots of fun and talks. And you know, we, we actually have it at a, a center, which is on the beach, but we also have hills and we have long nature walks. And that's something very special in India because there's not a lot of nature left in India. And, and then we do all the tests at the end. And during those 21 days, as people get better, we take off medicine. So many times people enter the retreat on say 24 medicines and they go out on just four. And that's really something that's life-changing. So when they're talking to their pe people at home, they, their friends and relatives also make changes just because they're seeing so many changes. So that's something that I really enjoy, but which has been stopped during the lockdown. And we really hope that we'll start our retreats again in October. So our goal is to build a culture of health. Like I really believe that we live in a culture of disease and it requires a shift in consciousness in order to get into a culture of health. And I'm going to share some of the things that we discussed today, just a few, because I know that Chef AJ, many of your audiences know about these things. So I won't spend too much time. Uh, so all our food is whole food and plant-based and it's actually based on nature's laws because I'm a homeopath and homeopathy is based on nature's laws. And that's something that I really appreciate about homeopathy. So what I mean about being based on nature's laws is that when I'm thinking about what to eat, I'm also trying to think about what did nature expect human beings to eat? So let me share a bit about this with you. You know, it's really rare to see animals in nature that are obese. So why do, why is it only humans, right? Like I went to Africa and there was so much grass, not a single overweight zebra and so many zebras, but not a single overweight lion. So why are we in that position? And I think it's because we're eating foods that are not natural to us. Like we're the only species that makes our food less nutritious by refining oil and sugar and white rice and white flour are just empty calories. And I know I'm doing some repetition, but anyway, um, if we had a cow, we would obviously feed it grass. And if we had a lion, we would feed it meat. But we do this because instinctively, these animals, that's what they eat. And we've lost touch with our own instincts. So if we were to put ourselves in touch with our instincts, like if we were on a farm or an orchard and we see fruits and vegetables, instinctively we feel like picking and eating them, don't we? But if you saw a chicken walk by or a goat or a cow, would your mouth water? And I'm sure you'll say no, no matter how much meat you eat, you say no, because our mouths don't water when we see these animals. And like true carnivores or even omnivores, 
We can't eat them raw, right? So who would salivate if they saw a chicken walk by? And the answer is probably a dog or a fox because a dog or a fox could pounce on the chicken and tear it apart and eat it raw. But we do salivate if we see a dish like this and that's only because of our conditioning. We've been conditioned. And so we have to unlearn a lot of things. For example, if we see green fields of wheat and rice, our mouths don't water. And we even know that so many people are gluten intolerant because wheat is not really our food. It's basically cow food. So the perfect food for us would be the food that we could potentially eat raw, right? That we're instinctively attracted to. And just to take it a little further, if you look at the teeth of carnivores and herbivores, and then look at the teeth of true omnivores, and then our own teeth, it's clear that we're not really omnivores. Our teeth are like herbivores, and we are actually frugivores. And I grew up on milk, and I think that, you know, the reason we drink milk is because we think it's healthy, at least I always was interested in health. And so I was always drinking glasses of milk. But that's because when we're young, our mothers run around us with that glass of milk. But actually milk is a food that every mammal produces only for its young. And we are not calves. And that's why every baby loves their mother's milk, but they don't appreciate cow's milk when it's first given to them. And so these are just a few of the examples of connecting to nature in order to think about what we need to eat. Like Chef AJ, I know your story has something to do with nuts. I know that you, know, you reduced your nut intake. And um, one of the reasons that nuts aren't our food is because if you were in nature and if you were under a walnut tree, but you had to open the walnuts with a stone or whatever you found in nature, you wouldn't be eating so many of them. And almonds are more difficult to open and cashews are almost impossible to open with your hands. And pistachios need to be roasted to be opened. And so these aren't really our foods, but because we can go and buy everything in a supermarket, we don't recognize this. So our idea is always use the right fuel. Like if you have a car that runs on petrol, there's no point putting diesel in it, even a little bit of diesel. And so if we start putting the right fuel in our body, things will be smooth. So our basic principles are plant-based foods that are suitable for our species. That means less of wheat or rice and more of vegetables and fruits and whole foods, no refined foods and organic as far as possible because we're the only species that sprays our food with poison so that other animals don't eat it and then we eat it. So that's a little weird and so we should look for things that have been grown as naturally as possible. And then vitamin B12 and vitamin D, these two, I mean, I always check all my patients and do all the tests. And here in India, we usually find that people have vitamin B12 and D deficiencies because these, you know, in our modern day lifestyle, we can't get enough of these vitamins just through food. I do know that in the US, a lot of foods are fortified. And so this might not be a big problem, but it is a problem here in India. And, you know, many people talk about intermittent fasting these days. And the principle behind intermittent fasting, I think, is that if we were living in nature, you couldn't forage for food until it's 
sunshine until it's dawn and you couldn't you wouldn't be eating after sunset so automatically you're eating only a certain number of hours in the day and and that's really the basis of intermittent fasting so if we look at what did nature expect us to do automatically we'll be there does that make sense that's so i'm taking i'm taking notes a lot of everything you say is making great sense okay okay great okay so now i'm going to start with the topic that i wanted to speak about about how making the connection brought me to my life's purpose and my goal is that you know when people are plant based and see the huge difference in their lives from turning plant based like i saw a huge difference in my health and state of mind then we definitely want to spread it and my goal was to inspire everyone to do that because so many people are stuck in jobs that they don't really enjoy but they have fabulous skills that they could use to spread this awareness so i'm going to tell you a little bit about my story but we already talked about it already some of it and about finding one's purpose and how to be at peace and we did already discuss some of these things so me as a child i was really good at school work but i had a lot of lack of self confidence and i felt insecure and i perceived myself as a victim of circumstances because this was not right or that was not right and i kind of felt that life was unfair not just to me but to others as well especially in india you know there's so many people who are so poor and i was lucky to be born with a silver spoon i think and then i used to i remember when i was young i'd be waking up every morning with a kind of fear and i couldn't say that i had a really happy childhood but i had a lot of gifts as a child sometimes you only see the negative without seeing the positive i had an amazing caring family and even an amazing caring extended family and a really fabulous school and my parents were interested in culture and so i learned dance and so many things and my families were very open to different points of view i lived in montreal for 5 years from the age of 5 to 10 and i had the opportunity to travel to different places and both my parents were intellectuals my father had done a phd and my mother had done her masters and and so actually i had so many gifts and we always had delicious food on the table that's something i owe to my mother because she she always thought it was important to cook good and healthy food for us i remember even when i was young we always had salads on the table for every meal and when i soon after i became a doctor like about 3 years after that my mother died of cancer and when i found out that she had cancer i tried to do everything that i knew at that time and i couldn't save her and it was like she was someone i really really thought the world of and depended on and she was gone when my life had hardly even started in a sense and so i thought it was hard but actually it was something that forced me to stand in, on my own feet and so all the things that happened to us i do believe that looks so bad eventually turn out to be for the best because there's growth from every tumble and then i underwent a series of illnesses i had a serious fracture and then i got malaria and pneumonia and finally i know malaria and pneumonia is not such a big deal but i was treating it holistically and 
and it was something that I learned a lot from. And then finally, I got Gia Bare. And Gia Bare is something that's so shocking because one moment you're well and the next moment you're completely paralyzed and I couldn't even turn in my bed. And although everyone suggested that I go to hospital, I was determined to not go through that kind of treatment. I really believed in holistic treatment. And I was lucky that, you know, I was at my father's house and we had some help to turn me and feed me and do all this so that I could recover at home. But it was so much learning. And I really believe that disease is a path to personal growth. And if I didn't go through all these things, I wouldn't be where I am. So when I got Gia Bare, I was talking to one of my friends who's a homeopath in Germany. And we were discussing and she said, what does Gia Bare mean? Gia Bare means that you were completely paralyzed, that you couldn't move, which means that your body was telling you to do nothing. And that was really significant because before that I had been working a lot, traveling for work, doing so many things. I lived in a busy city. This is where I live in Mumbai. I lived at that time. And she told me that if you really want to get well, you have to change everything. And I thought, I mean, it was difficult to change everything, to make a 180 degree change. But I moved from Mumbai to Oroville where I live now. And this is my house right now in Oroville. So it's totally in nature. And, and it's really simple and minimalistic. And this changed everything too. And when I was here, I was watching, a cat moved in with me the day I moved there. And I was watching animals in nature. And I started thinking about all the things that now I work with at Sharan. So this is my house and this is the area where I live. And it's right on the beach. It's a really beautiful place, but it's minimalistic and very simple and very close to nature. So much so that I never lock my door and the animals can go in and out. And the squirrels, the rats, the birds, the dogs, and the cats, they all drink from the same bowl. So it's, it's an amazing place. Now, I told you about why I first made the switch because I found that milk was cruelty. And there were a lot of incidents in my life, including ending up in a Russian prison. Let me tell you that story. I was teaching in Russia and uh, I went there after a tour of uh, Western Europe where I had been teaching. And when I was leaving Russia, they asked me if I had any foreign exchange. And I said, yes, I did. And they asked me if I had declared it when I entered. And I said, no, I didn't know about it. And they said, contraband, contraband. Next thing I knew I was in prison. And I was just so lucky that the person who had invited me for the teaching assignment knew a good lawyer and he got in touch right away. And within three days, I was out of prison. But that really made me understand what it must be for animals to be in prison their entire life. And so I just knew that I had to do something about this. I think that, you know, different incidents happen to us in our lives just so that it puts us in a direction. And if you're watching this, then probably this, there's something in this meant for you too. 
And then I told you I did an internship at Palm Sanctuary. And there, the day I reached there, someone rescued a baby calf that was just two days old and who was left to die because he had diarrhea and he wasn't worth the $2 people sold baby calves for at that time. And so I brought him up and it was like, bringing up a calf is like bringing up a dog or a baby or, I mean, when he said his first moo, it was like, oh, wow. It was, it was amazing experience. And being a doctor, I was understanding more and more that medicines never cure. You know, we talked about Dr. Neil Barnard and Dr. Neil Barnard came to India to do uh, talks on reversing diabetes. And, you know, when someone has diabetes, they go to the doctor and the doctor gives them medicines and it never, they never get better. And over a period of time, the medicine just grow in number. So I realized that well, actually, medicines don't cure anything. Medicines only control diseases. And I'm not interested in controlling diseases. And even homeopathy, which works at a different level, actually works at the level of energy. And I think it's more curative. But even then, people who I was treating would come back to me after three months or maybe three years with the same illness. So I knew that whatever I was doing all this time isn't making a change, but what I was doing for myself was making a huge change. And so I had to make changes in the way I was treating people. This is just a cartoon, but it's, I think it's really true. The top prescription is for your arthritis but it may cause a heart attack. The second prescription should prevent a heart attack, but it could damage your liver. And the third should prevent liver trouble, but it may destroy your spleen and so on and so forth. And I've seen in our 21 day retreats that those people who come in on 24 medication will go out on just four in just 21 days. In fact, those who come in on four medications, they may go out on none or maybe one, but the ones who are on lots of medications, as soon as you start taking away one or another medication, it all falls down like a pack of cards and suddenly they don't need medications anymore. Because our body always works to heal. And you know, while I'm talking, I feel I could give a talk on every slide for an hour. So I can't, so I'm just moving forward, but I'm trying to put everything that I'm trying to say as short as possible. So, you know, when we treat with medicines, we're treating only the symptoms, but not the cause. Now, what I'm doing right now is working at the level of cause. One of the causes that we're sick is because we're eating foods that are not suitable for our species at all. And so my work transitioned from homeopathy to nutrition. And now I, I, you know, I used to ask my patients when they came to me that, do you want me to treat you or do you want me to teach you how you can be healthy all your life by yourself. And they didn't know what they were in for, but obviously they said the second. And then I would tell them about how they could change their diet. And then I realized that people don't want to change. It's really difficult to change anything. And so I started doing whole day seminars called Peas versus Pills. And one of the points of doing it the whole day was that I would serve breakfast and lunch and a big snack, which would serve as dinner so that people could experience what it felt like to be completely whole and plant-based for a whole day. And even that one day made 
sort of changes in the mind. When I started, I would even throw in a cooking class into that seminar. But as the seminars grew bigger and bigger, I didn't have the space to do cooking classes for so many people. And so I put the cooking classes on video. Okay. I'm not able to move the slide right now. Uh -oh. Wish I could help you. <laughs> okay. I don't know what's happening. Let me try stop and share. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. Stop screen share and try again. This has been amazing. I've been taking all these notes. Okay, but I'm not able to stop screen share oh, now. Uh, here, I can probably get you okay. out of that. Uh, let's see. Options. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can kick you out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Screen share. Okay, now I'm hearing. Uh, okay, okay. Now something happened. Let me. Oh gosh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Did that help at all? Yes, yes. I think everything's working out now. It's gonna work. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's oh. Okay. It's oh okay. See if you can get your presentation back on. Okay. Okay, there we are. Huh? Oh gosh. Ah. Okay. So uh, this is a video actually, but I'm not going to show it. Um, this is one of the first um, patients that I actually recorded. And this lady, she had heart disease for three years. And she had just come out of the ICU to my consulting. And she came because she had a prescription one page long and she didn't want to take medicine. And when I met her, I was going to be traveling. And so I told her everything about diet. I gave her Dean Ornish's book on reversing heart disease. And she was a kindergarten school teacher and she was 70 years old. But she read the book from cover to cover, put it in practice. And this video is actually two and a half months after the first interview, when she said that she had not only got better, lost weight and everything, but for three years, she could hardly get out of bed. And now she was getting up in the morning uh, at four o'clock actually, and going for a walk and going to the gym in the evening. This was just two and a half uh, months after being in ICU. And this was in 2005. And this is her in 2013, where I actually had to chase her to get this photograph of her because she went on a light jog every day on the marina of Pondicherry. So, you know, I saw these kind of amazing changes. People who thought that they may not survive were getting well. And I also realized that, you know, when people have one foot in the grave, they're likely to do anything you say and they'll get well. But if people just have a sniffle, they're really, they're really resistant to change. And I told you about my experience with um, the change in the state of mind. And so I started asking my own patients about their experiences when they changed to plant-based diet. I learned a lot about that too. But what I learned is that we, we are what we eat. The feelings of the animal are transmitted to us through their hormones that produce these emotions. And so when we eat animal products, we are taking in their insecurity, their forsakenness, their hopelessness and despair, and their fear. And I could relate it to what I felt as a child, because I had all these insecurities and things when I was a child. And I can tell you a lot of it has disappeared. I, and I remember once I was traveling to Spain 
and for a conference and the flights from India to Spain are overnight. So I reached in the morning, I was really hungry and I reached the conference area and they had a huge eating area outside with all these little stalls and there was nothing vegan, absolutely nothing. Even all their salads had cold cuts and there was just nothing at that time in Spain. And so I ordered French fries because there was nothing else and I wanted to have something vegan. And it came with mayonnaise and ketchup kind of on top. And I thought I was really starving and I thought, should I take away the mayonnaise? And I decided to have it just because it looked so good. And also because I thought that I can't bring back that life. So I might as well have it. And then I went to sleep and I woke up with the same insecurity that I had felt for years as a child. And I realized, it took me a while though, it took me a few days to make this connection, but I realized that this was just from eating that bit of mayonnaise. And you know, I've made mayonnaise in my life and I know that mayonnaise is just like one egg and a whole liter of oil makes a lot of mayonnaise. So having a little bit of mayonnaise means a very little part of the egg. And yet I woke up with these feelings that I had not had for a long time. So I made the connection and I started asking my patients and I realized that a lot of people experienced the changes that I had been experiencing. They found more clarity, they were more relaxed, more grounded, more mature, more security, confidence, responsibility, contentment. It was as if they were in a new paradigm. And I asked so many patients about this and it was just like, some of them don't, don't recognize, but a lot of them do. In fact, I remember that I was treating a patient and she, she one day got back to me and she said, you know, I'm following everything that you say and my depression has come back. And so I asked another doctor about this and I said, asked her if she had any experience with someone following a plant-based diet and getting depression. And that doctor told me that, you know, people get much more sensitive when they're on a plant-based diet. And so maybe she just had some, a little bit of dairy that she wasn't aware of or something. And it brought back these feelings, ask her. And so I asked her that, have you had anything? And we found out that she had a little bit of chocolate with dairy in it. And because of that, her depression came back. And that doctor who I had discussed it with had experienced the same thing. That's how she knew about it. Which brings me to Dr. Neil Nedley, who I also heard in one of the videos of uh, Veg Source Expo. And he's treating people with depression with plant-based diet. And he even has a 14-day depression recovery retreat. So I think that's just so amazing. These are some of the images from our retreats. Our retreats are so amazing too. And this lists some of the food from our retreats. And when you're eating foods with high nutritive value, you find that you're automatically eating less. Like we have all these buffets and in the first week, everyone wants to try everything and so they're actually eating more and they're losing weight. But by the second week, since everyone knows that the food is always there, I always tell the chefs that don't make so much because I know that their uh, eating is going to decrease to half automatically because we're using high quality nutrients and no nutritional supplements are required except for vitamin B12 and D because these aren't available in our artificial lifestyle. 
and the foods are really tasty and you don't even need so many spices actually we all have a bit a ball cooking and eating and lots of fun nutrients and colors go hand in hand and so we should always try to eat all the colors of the rainbow every day now i truly believe that we are caring and compassionate species and when we are young we are totally connected to animals children love animals and if they don't have any connection to animals they have connection to the stuffed toys in their crib you know but all children are connected to animals and as we grow we kind of disconnect from them but really it's just because of our conditioning that you know we are forced to disconnect otherwise we just couldn't survive i live in a a village now and i'm seeing cruelty everywhere that people aren't seeing just because of our conditioning the calves are tied up their entire life away from their mothers and so on and so forth so my message is that if you you know we are all compassionate beings at heart and if we connect to this then a lot of things can change we are also always the author of our disease which also makes us the author of our health and so it's all in our hands to take charge of our health and almost any passion can be followed with the skill set we already have like i really really wanted to live on a farm and have a farm sanctuary and look after all these animals but i couldn't for two reasons like i didn't have the money i actually also didn't have the skills and i didn't have the manpower like even if i found the money how would i get all the right people to grow into a farm sanctuary but i did have the skills of a doctor and i'm so happy that you know i know that i'm changing lives of so many people every day and this is going to save so many more animals every year and help the environment and and so i know that i'm living my purpose even though i can't do exactly what i want it makes me happy that i'm doing what it was meant to do so your work and your passion can actually be one i'm often working from 7 in the morning to you can see now but sometimes 11 at night and i always make it a point to look after myself though i mean i always cook my own food and um things like that but because i love my work i can keep doing it this way and plant based diet is good for health environment animals everything and so i really wonder who wouldn't want to be on a plant based diet if they knew that all the food could be equally delicious and especially at a time like this where we have covid um we can protect ourselves from such diseases or even if you can't protect yourself from getting covid we all know that now you know there's been articles about how plant based diet protect you from having serious covid and i've been treating covid patients all this time through both the lockdown and you know so have other doctors in our organization and we've not lost a single case we've always had success with our methods of treating and plant based diet this is my book reversing diabetes in 21 days and i'm happy to say that you know it's been a number one best seller on amazon india and i haven't done anything to spread this message it's just working by word of mouth 
So that's really all I want to say. I, I truly believe that everyone has skill sets and you can plug them into anything to help animals, environment, and ultimately we're always helping ourselves. So I'm going to stop my share now and I'm back to you. Great. Thank you so much. You know, I took a, a, about a page worth of notes and it's interesting what you said about how uh, when you become plant-based, when you become vegan, you become more sensitive. When you think about it, the animals that eat other animals, they're the aggressive animals, the herbivores, bunnies, can, yeah. you know, they're, they're very docile because they're not eating out their animals, I think. Right. Have you noticed this yourself in your own life? Absolutely. Just, yeah. just anxiety dialed down and just much more peace of mind. And I, and I think what you say, I've heard that from other people that when animals are being slaughtered for food, they know it. And that, that increases their stress hormones, their fear, and we're ingesting that into our bodies. Yes. Yeah. That's a, so how many years now have you been vegan? Well, I'm ashamed to say that I wasn't 100% vegan from the time I knew about dairy, which was like uh, around 1980. That's when I knew. And so I left dairy, but I would still eat something that was cooked in butter or ghee or some, you know. And I became 100% vegan about 20 years ago, so it's only 20. Well, that's still pretty darn good, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and you made the point about how we're the only species that spray our food with poison. And, and I think about it, we're the only species that actually eats poison, like going to McDonald's. And from what I've read, the amount of fast food in India has really increased over the last few years. Oh, yeah, it has. Now, I don't know a lot about it because I never go there, but yeah, it has. Well, I would imagine the disease rates have probably increased too because of that. Really? And also the spectrum of diseases. Like when I started, I was treating a lot of patients with diabetes and hypertension, but now I'm treating people with cancers and chronic kidney disease almost every day. So, and autoimmune diseases as well. Wow, that's interesting. And I love what you said about nuts because yes, it's true that, you know, and what people don't realize, yes, you could take a walnut and cr crush it with a rock, but in nature, that walnut had more over it than just the little brown thing. It was like, they, they're like, this, I've seen nuts in nature and they're like about the size of a saw. It's like, so how are we eating a half an ounce of nuts at every meal? Our ancestors wow. couldn't have done that. And I didn't realize how you mentioned certain nuts, like almonds and cashews and probably I'm guessing maybe even Brazil nuts they can't be opened by humans not really not really pistachios yeah it's interesting so thank you for saying that so I have a few questions from our good friend Sharon and she said to please ask Dr. Shah if most of the people who died of COVID in India also had comorbidities and if she thinks that's because the diet is so heavy on dairy and ghee okay so actually, I recently did a whole talk on COVID prevention, treatment, and post-COVID um, therapy. But anyway, here's what I want to say that a lot of the people died of comorbidities, but a lot of the people died of what I consider wrong treatment. And I just will say a few things about this. So, you know, we treat people according to what nature would have expected. So for example, when you get fever, what does your body tell you to do? To rest. To rest and what else? Drink, drink fluids. Drink Water. fluids, okay. And does your body say that it's hungry? No, I don't remember ever really being hungry when I've had a fever. Okay. So our body is telling us not to eat, right? But often family members or parents, so they'll tell you to eat something when you have fever, right? And we know that when you tell a kid to eat, they'll throw up when they have fever because they can't, you know, their body. And the reason our body tells us not to eat is because the body is saying, don't do anything uh, don't make me do anything so that I can heal. And the body works to heal. And the body actually, 
raises the temperature when we have any infection so that the contagion cannot multiply. Just like, you know, we boil water to kill the germs. So we, the, our body raises the temperature so that bacteria or virus cannot multiply. The very first thing they do is bring down the fever. Now, this is actually dangerous because now the virus multiplies. And there were so many things that were done in India, you know, giving multiple medications. And also now the body has to fight those medications and this. And actually, there's no real medication for viruses. So all the patients that we were treating, we were kind of treating just with diet and with no medication. Okay, that's a bit out of the scope of this whole talk, but um, so people have died of comorbidities, people have died of, you know, getting COVID and going into a hospital where there was not enough in infrastructure to, to look after you. People have died of over medications. Uh, there's the whole spectrum. Great, and I did. I did see. I did watch part of that video on your YouTube channel, as well as some some of the wonderful cooking demos on your YouTube channel with you and with someone else making a bunch of jams without sugar. I love that one, by the way. And there's one of you cooking with Dr. Neil Barnard. Yeah, that that, was, uh, that must have been so much fun. He was wearing his apron. <laughs> and Sharon also wanted me to ask you: Do you feel that the plant-based movement is growing in India, and will you be able to get back to doing your in-person retreats anytime soon? So we have a retreat scheduled for October, and we don't know what will happen. We had one scheduled for June, and we had to cancel. And um, yeah. Uh, and the first part of the question, sorry, I missed that. Oh, do you feel that the plant-based movement is growing? Oh, yes. Yes, it's growing phenomenally. Like, um, there are new plant-based entrepreneurs every day. We have a Vegan India conference coming up in July. So it's very soon. And, um, yeah, we couldn't have thought of a Vegan India conference two or three years ago because there was nobody there. So yeah, That's it is fantastic. really growing. Yeah. That's fantastic. And it, she has two more questions. What are the most common lifestyle diseases in India? I bet your diabetes is up there. Diabetes, yes. And high blood pressure and heart disease. But now cancers, cancers are just exploding, you know. Can, yeah. Can people get your 21 days to get rid of diabetes book in the United States or is it only available on Amazon? I think it's available on Amazon US and I'm not sure right now because of the lockdown and if you know parcels aren't coming but it's available on Kindle so at least that must be available in the US that's I fantastic need to check that one yeah and the last question from Sharon is what are your favorite Indian dishes to make now that you are oil free Oh gosh, that's a hard one. Uh, I don't know how it works with you, Chef AJ, but me, I just go into my kitchen and open the fridge and see what's there. And I'm always buying organic and locally grown stuff. So it changes from season to season. And um, what are my favorite Indian dishes? Oh, it's changing all the time. Maybe rajma. Rajma is made with kidney beans and tomatoes and spices with, um, and I usually have it with millets or whole grain rice. But you know, to tell you the truth, I'm automatically uh, transitioning into more and more raw. It's happening by itself. So even though I always prepare my own food, I don't use a lot of Dough. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do, you have do you have instant pots in India? Uh, probably it's available and I don't have one. But, but, but you but probably have a pressure cooker, right? Yes, yes, yes. What about an air fryer? Is that a tool that's very common or heard of in India? A lot of people have one and I have a very simple house. So 
I don't even have an oven in my house. It's that simple, you know. I wow. really, it's a blender and two um, burners and that's it. Wow. What kind of things do you typically eat for breakfast? I have the same thing every day in different ways, which is a big green smoothie made with fresh green leaves from my garden, bananas, and any other fruit. And right now that's mangoes and jackfruit because we have fabulous sweet jackfruit right now in season and mangoes. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, one of the biggest takeaways for me, which I've known instinctively, but you had a slide that said, medicine never cures. Yes, it's true. But lifestyle does. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for the work you're doing in India and in the world. And I wish you every success. And I'm, I'm so happy to have met you and had you on the show. How can people find out more about you, support your work? I don't know. Do you like them to go to YouTube or do you have a social media presence? Where would people find out more about your work? Oh, yeah. So I would say the best place is our website because that's where, you know, we have so many things. We have events and, you know, we even have online programs like an online basic cooking class and a reversing diabetes online program and six weeks online program and and now all our other programs are on Zoom as well. So we have more things with recordings and so on. So I would say our website, but we also have Facebook and Instagram and um, YouTube, of course, YouTube, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's where I saw you, your cooking video. Tell me a little bit more about the award you uh, received from the president. What is the award? Who, who is or was the president? And how did that come to be? Okay, so there's a special award for women who are doing exceptional work. And they somehow found me, I don't really know how. Um, so I was awarded that, that for a pioneering work in health and nutrition. Is it, yeah. was it a plaque? Was it a ceremony? How did that transpire? Well, it was money, like real money. They flew me over there to Delhi and a bunch of other people. I wasn't the only one. So there were about 20 people. Every year they have 20 or some number of people. And so they flew me over there and um, put me up in a hotel. And I was also allowed to take someone with me. And all, you know, they had all these things. We had a snacks with the prime minister and we went out for dinner and we did all these things. Yeah and met a lot of amazing people because you know the whole group of people they were all people who were doing amazing things in their own field so that was something really amazing and we're still on the whatsapp group of all those you know that group our year of winners so that's something really yeah it was something special i guess that sounds incredible. And that's kind of the purpose of my show is to highlight people that are doing incredible things in their field and mostly they're people in the field of plant-based, but still, I really, I, that sounds like an amazing experience that you had. Yeah. And I really, I, I think you're so amazing what you do. And I love that video of yours where you take off the clothes that are so big. and you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you a bit more. Thank you, Chef AJ, for inviting me. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have another fabulous guest.